So Prof, without any waste of time, I want you to take over and to everybody else, I will see you guys on the other side of the call. Prof, over to you. Thank you very much, John and Belinda and also Kathy for this opportunity to talk to you. And I'll be talking about the topic of this book, Fishes of the Okavango Delta and Chobe River Botswana, uh, published by Strake Nature. It's a wonderful little book packed with information based on original research. And uh, I must say it's been a fascinating adventure for me to have been involved in. So let's first look at the Okavango Delta, which is a very unusual system as it is a delta that never reaches the sea. Uh, it starts up in the highlands of Angola with the rivers called the Cubango, and then uh, the Cabango River flows through southern Angola, across the Caprivi Strip, and into Botswana. And there it meets a, a fault line called the Gamari Fault, which causes the water to spread out. And the water spreads out and flows southwards, and then at the uh, bottom end uh, hits another fault line, uh, which causes it to travel at, at right angles towards Lake Ngami. And the, the factors that cause the formation of the Okavango Delta are the same as uh, those that created the African Great Lakes with the movement of tectonic plates affecting the way in which water is distributed and stored. The remarkable thing about Okavango is it, uh, it varies in, in water surface area from 6,000 to 15,000 square kilometers, depending on whether you're in the dry season or in the flood season. And 11 cubic kilometers of flood water enter the, the river, uh, the delta um, every year, with the flood starting from about March onwards and peaking uh, from June to August. In addition, there's a substantial amount of local rainfall that falls on the system. So it, it's a wetland like no other uh, in Africa. And it's not surprising that it was recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. And in fact, was the 1000th World Heritage Site uh, that was recognized. In addition to that, the Okavango Delta has been chosen as one of the seven natural wonders of Africa. And there you can see the others, the Red Sea Reefs and Gorogoro Crater, Serengeti, Bildebius and Zebra and other migrations, Sahara Desert, Mount Kilimanjaro and the Nile River. I'm not sure what criteria we use to choose these seven, but I think they should perhaps have chosen 10 uh, because how can one possibly leave out uh, the Great Lakes of Africa, uh, Madagascar and, um, and various other important natural features uh, of our wonderful continent. Uh, Okavango is, is a wonderfully peaceful place, although underwater it's uh, ruthless in tooth and claw as nature always is. And there you can see a typical scene with a, a wooden dugout, Makoro, uh, being poled along uh, through a narrow channel. And the amazing thing about the Okavango is how many different kinds of habitats and ecosystems one has. And, you know, in nature one realizes that Although the, the Okavango is very variable, depending on whether the floodwaters have reached the delta or not, it's also very predictable. So variability and predictability can go together. And those are two characteristics of the Okavango. And there you can see during the high flood, uh, the uh, wetlands are all inundated. And, and the system really consists of three components, the, what we call the panhandle, which is the Kavango River flowing in, uh, the permanent or perennial swamp in the upper reaches, uh, which always has water, and then the uh, seasonal swamp in the lower reaches, uh, which is largely depleted of water during the dry season. There's another uh, scene, and you can see going across from left to right, a hippo path. Hippos are very important in the ecology of the Okavango, but so are termites. Um, amazing thing is that the, the slope uh, of the Okavango Delta from its upper reaches down to Maan, which is um, uh, so over 100 kilometers, there's only a 60 meter drop in water level. So in some areas, termite mounds are actually the tallest landforms. And ter termite mounds are also very important because they allow 
uh, tree copses to develop around them. And sometimes they develop into uh, new islands with all the characteristics of um, island ecology. And there you can see uh, an e examples of the wide variety of aquatic habitats one sees in the Okavango, large lagoons, papyrus lined river uh, courses, uh, narrow uh, rivers, and then the, um, the flays and, and malapos and so on, which are covered with water lilies. And there again, uh, examples, uh, top left is a dried out flay, uh, actually in the floodplain of the Chobe River, and then the very important flooded wetlands underwater with a great uh, variety of plants providing three-dimensional habitat, and then a lot of um, sandy and muddy uh, sediments. Uh, a very important component of Okavango is Lake Ngami, which is a lake arrowed uh, right at the end uh, of the, uh, the whole catchment. And it's one of the largest lakes uh, that forms a part of the Okavango and um, was seen by David Livingston in 1849. Of course, he didn't discover it. It was already very well known to local inhabitants, but he did publicize its existence uh, to the Western world. And this led to many um, explorers and scientists visiting Lake Ngami and collecting uh, fish specimens there. Now, Lake Ngami, in, in living, when Livingston visited it, was about 200 square kilometers in area, so it was a large lake. When we visited it in 1982, this is what remained, and there I am standing uh, in this sort of fluid mud, um, and the only uh, fishes that had survived to this stage were the air-breathing uh, Clarius species, Clarius carifinus and Ingomensis, the blunt tooth and the shark tooth catfish. There were also a few little crocodiles in among them. Um, but scattered around uh, that remaining little water body were tens of thousands of catfish skulls. And uh, these are catfish that had died when the water receded and they were eaten by marabou storks and, and hyenas and, and all sorts of other things. And we were able to identify the two different species of catfish because they're tooth bands on, on their uh, jaws uh, are different. So we were able to quantify the, um, the proportions of the two species. So remember Lake Ngami is also part of the Okavango. And then included in our coverage in the book is the Chobe River, which is on the northeast uh, border of um, Botswana. It is of course, part of the upper Zambezi system rather than the Kubango Kavango system. But for completeness, uh, we wanted to reflect all the freshwater fishes of uh, Botswana. We included the Chobe. Now, our Okavango research was carried out in several phases. Firstly, in January 1971, I had the opportunity to make a, a private visit to the Okavango with Carolyn, uh, who, who would later become my wife and her friends through the Okavango Wildlife Society. And that really opened up my eyes to the opportunities to carry out research um, in that area. And then some eight years later, I was part of a multidisciplinary expedition from Rhodes University, organized by Ron, Rob Fincham of the Geography Department. And you can see we took a number of staff, um, Andrew Stone, a hydrologist, Roy Lucky, the botanist, I did the fishes, and uh, as well as 14 students, including Anne Morley and Bev Taylor, who did uh, further research on the Delta. And then between 79 and 92, um, I initiated an intensive uh, research program in the Okavango with a full team. Uh, it included the three authors of the book, Glenn Merrin, Paul Skelton, and myself. Uh, Rex Crick did an MSc on the impact of endosulfan spraying on the fishes. Pete White did work on the taxonomy of squeakers and then various other staff members of the Ichthyology Institute and the department uh, took part, including Tom Heff, Charles Hokett, Liz Tarr, the artists, Nick James, Kathy Holden, and Shirley Bethune. And logistics, Ted Baines was the faithful pilot who flew some of us from Grahamstown, Wakanda, uh, to uh, Mount, uh, while the students normally drove up in the vehicles. And then PJ and Bar Barney Bestlink were hosts to us at Guma Lagoon, Pete Smith, a wonderful host uh, 
a botanist resident in Mound, Jeff Bowles, the eccentric uh, tsetse fly researcher, um, John Rogers, Rod Murphy, Clive Stain, and others. And we were very privileged to have as our invited guests on these expeditions, some very prominent scientists, including Humphrey Greenwood, who was then head of the freshwater, freshwater fish section at the Natural History Museum in London, Hans Peters and his wife, Sylvia Burns from Germany, Ilan Paperna, parasite expert from Israel, Ben van der Waal, um, uh, ichthyologist from South Africa, Chris Appleton, the mollusk and Bilhazia expert, and Eugene and Christine Ballon from Canada. So there were three phases in this uh, work, um, which continued after my main expeditions uh, from 92 to 99. Paul and Roger Bills took part in a rapid bioassessment program. And then there was interim research by various people. And from 2015, uh, Paul has been involved in the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project. Because the Delta is, is so large, we had to establish uh, field stations. And our main one was at Crocodile Camp on the Tamalakani River, but we also established uh, field stations elsewhere in the Delta. And as you can imagine, running this research project from Grahamstown um, in the Okavango was a major logistical challenge. And uh, working in the field, as I'll illustrate along the way, also has its hazards. So there's the core team uh, on the left, Paul Skelton, in the middle, Tiny, uh, myself, and Glenn Merrin. Glenn Merrin had joined us from the University of Michigan, Carl Lagerer's uh, ichthyology school, and he did his PhD on Okavango fishes. And there, another photo in, in the field in Rundu and Namibia, uh, with Paul seated in the middle, and on the right, um, Shirley Bethune, and, and Glenn is one of the figures in the middle. And there's another photo of, of an expedition. As you can see, we weren't exactly formally dressed. Um, and there, Liz Tarr, uh, she was the artist. I see um, Rex Quick um, and myself and others. And then another photograph, and there's uh, Humphrey Greenwood um, and Ilan Paperna, as well as uh, the two scientists from Germany. So we were very privileged to have uh, this, uh, these leading experts with us in the field. And I even spent a summer holiday in the Okavango, mainly at Guma Lagoon, uh, with my family continuing our research. And there's one of our researchers, Pete Smith, um, who did work on squeakers. And here we are at La Paneng Bridge, typical um, small lagoon uh, where we did our work. And there Glenn is gazing through the camera. Um, we photographed um, as many species as we could. And top left is one of the more unusual fishes we found, a master cambulus eel. And on the right, you can see the stomachs are being removed and um, large numbers of stomach contents were analyzed so that we could get some handle on the food web of the Okavango. And just uh, for interest, uh, this is Glenn Merrin, uh, top left before he joined us uh, doing work on trout in, in North America. And then after he left us, he's now formed a consultancy company in Nevada, Reno, Nevada, called Inland Ecosystems. And we're still in touch with them. And very important uh, part of our expeditions were the um, assistance we could recruit locally, including James and Supi and Kevin, shown here. Now let's do a, a quick overview of uh, representatives of some of the fish groups that we discovered in the Okavango. And I should mention that some res fish research had been done in the Okavango, but it was very sporadic based on short data series and, and a relatively small numbers of specimens. So our long-term program was the first comprehensive study of the fishes. And here's a, a typical one, the Kavango stone basher, named after the upper reaches of the Kavango system. And this is a momyrid, which is a soft-bodied fish with very small scales. You can see it's got a sort of stubby um, head. And uh, some of them have quite an elongated uh, sort of trunk uh, in the front. They have a second dorsal fin, which is very elongated and, and almost symmetrical uh, with the anal fin and an extended caudal peduncle at the base of the tail. 
And in that caudal peduncle are specially modified uh, muscles which can produce electrical discharges. And a remarkable thing about these fishes is that they communicate with one another using electrical discharges, and they're also able to detect the electrical fields of predators and prey uh, to help them uh, survive predation and, and find their food. And a, a number of the species um, that we record in the book of uh, these snout fishes, in fact, are newly described over the last 10 years. And many of them are distinguished by the differences between their electrical discharges. They typically grub around in the bottom sediments, uh, feeding on insect larvae and, uh, and other small in invertebrates. And they're quite an important part of the catch of, of um, local fishermen in using their traditional fishing methods. And they're also important prey for the larger catfish. And cyprinids, uh, for instance, this blackback barb, are, are a very important part of the whole ecosystem. They tend to live in relatively shallow water and take advantage of the flood um, and breed in the, in the recently inundated areas. And they're, of course, um, important prey for the larger predatory fish. Then there are uh, the citharines, uh, which look similar to the barbs, but in fact are more closely related to the tiger fish. And they, they have a similar habitat um, and can also be found along the fringes of the, uh, the rivers and, and channels. The tiger fish, one of the iconic uh, fishes of Africa, and arguably one of the best uh, angling, freshwater angling fishes um, in the world. They are the top predators in the Okavango. You'll find them patrolling around in uh, midwater, in the larger water bodies and along the fringes of the river channels. And uh, they have uh, large teeth in their jaws, uh, some, somewhat similar to those of crocodiles and beautifully colored. And you can see their scientific name, Hydrocinus vitatus, Translated means striped water dog, uh, which describes them very well. Um, Tigerfish uh, have some very interesting behavior patterns. One of them is that they uh, can hunt in groups, even though they are voracious as individuals, they increase their hunting efficiency by hunting in groups. And they do this by hovering around uh, the exits of uh, river channels when the floodwaters are receding and which are forcing uh, snout fishes and cyprinids and other smaller fishes back into the main water body. So they, they prey on them as they force back into the main water body. And they tend to dominate um, the predation scene with the um, African pike being the secondary uh, predator. Uh, there's a silver robber, uh, which is also related to the tiger fish and is another one of the predators. Now, perhaps the most interesting fish in the Okavango is a Southern African pike, uh, Hepsitis cuviara, uh, which like many other species reaches its Southern limit of distribution in the Okavango. And it belongs to a family, the Hepsitidae, uh, which is um, found only in Africa. And they are also very efficient predators, uh, although secondary uh, to, to the tiger fish and have a similar structure. You can see a dorsal fin is far back and they have a little fleshy adipose fin between the dorsal fin and the tail fin. Um, one of the most interesting things we found about the African pike is their breeding method. Um, this had been very uh, briefly recorded back in the 1930s, where it was suggested that they make a foam nest, but no further confirmation was found of that. And then on one of our expeditions um, up in Shikawi, uh, I remember um, snorkeling along the edge of the lagoon, which is a bit of a hazardous occupation because there were crocodiles around. And I noticed some foam and I had, initially I thought it was sort of cold water omo that someone had used to do their washing. But on closer examination, I noticed two adult pike hovering below the nest. And then when I looked even closer, there were larvae, a fish larvae hanging underneath the foam. And we were subsequently able to document their breeding behavior, especially with Kathy Holden, and uh, found how, out how they form these nests, that both parents guard the young, 
and initially the eggs are laid in the foam and then when the eggs hatch um, the larvae drop uh, to the bottom of the foam nest and hover there until eventually they swim away. So that was a, a wonderful finding um, illustrating how this very interesting fish um, breeds. And uh, the pike along with the tiger fish and, and some of the la larger cichlids are piscivorous uh, feeding on small fishes. Um, there are a number of catfish species um, in the, um, the delta. This is a stargazer mountain catfish, which is in the habit of sort of snuggling into the bottom sediments and the sand, and then with its eyes sticking out, uh, looking up, hence the name stargazer. Um, one of the most abundant and dominant fishes in the Okavango, as is the case in, in, in large part, other parts of Southern Africa, is a shark toothed catfish, Clarius gripinus. And gripinus uh, refers to it being found originally in the Orange River or the Kharip River. And I know this fellow quite well because I did my PhD in it and I've continued to study it. Um, the sharp toothed catfish um, has an air breathing organ, uh, a modified um, gill arch. So it is extremely hardy and able to survive in deoxygenated water and even in fluid mud. As long as it can keep its uh, air breathing organ uh, clear of mud, uh, even if its gills are completely clogged up, it's able to survive. And they are omnivores feeding on invertebrates, uh, mollusks, uh, crustaceans, uh, for instance, uh, as well as on, on small fishes. And they undertake a massive feeding migration up the panhandle along the edges of the river um, during uh, some parts of the year. Uh, it's, it's a very important fish in the indigenous fishery um, as it uh, creates, uh, produces large fillets. And so a very important fish from the ecological and uh, the fishery perspective. And there's an image of the catfish feeding migration. And what we found is that they were mainly feeding on snout fishes, which are being forced back into the main river as the flood water recedes. Another a group of a catfish found in the Okavango are the squeakers, a remarkable looking uh, fishes uh, with a bony head uh, and their pectoral fins have sharp spines as does the first dorsal fin. So, and they can lock those spines out to form a triangle uh, to prevent them from being swallowed by predators. And this unfortunately also makes them very vulnerable to being caught in gill nets and also is a problem for fishermen, for anglers uh, who get pricked by their sharp spines. They're called up down, upside down catfish uh, because they swim upside down under logs and under the papyrus mat and also at the water surface. Um, sucking up and catching uh, prey. And then one of the most remarkable fishes we found, which is uh, quite rare, well, we, it was rare in our catches, it may not be rare in reality, it's the oscillated spiny eel, uh, Massassembolus van der Waal, named after Ben van der Waal, the South African scientist who first discovered it. And they uh, tend to live in, in very well vegetated uh, habitats and are, are quite difficult to catch. The mini spine climbing perch, um, like the uh, Clarius catfish, has an air breathing organ uh, and it's able to um, shuffle around uh, on, uh, after rain outside of water bodies using the spines on its gill cover uh, as a sort of levers to push it along. They're very hardy fish and will often be found in, in deoxygenated environments that are uh, busy drying up. And then the, the cichlids are a large and important group of Okavango fishes. Many of them are important in the traditional fishery and also for angling. Um, and uh, some of them are now uh, harvested live for the aquarium trade, like this beautiful banded uh, jewel fish. And, and they are, um, typically are, have a fairly advanced breeding strategy. Most of them are, are, are uh, mouth brooders uh, and some of them are guarders. Whoops. Um, there are three spot tilapia, um, a very common and important fish in the Okavango. 
and it effectively uh, fills a niche that the Mozambique tilapia, Orichromis mozambicus, uh, does um, elsewhere in southern Africa. Um, the red breast tilapia is, is the only uh, purely plant eating um, fish species in the Okavango. And here are some further examples uh, the thin face, large mouth, the nembui, um, and then moving, uh, looking at a saprinid labio. And uh, there's a typical scene in Guma Lagoon where we're collecting uh, these fishes. So the southern um, mouth brooder, Sinocrani labris philander, a beautiful fish, uh, quite a voracious uh, predator, and it's one of the guarding um, cichlids. The thin face largemouth. Um, this is a very common, important fish in the traditional fishery, also important for angling, and they are uh, very efficient predators, um, taking uh, large invertebrates and, and small fishes. And then uh, the only fish in the Okavango that currently listed as endangered is the Caprivi killifish, uh, which was found up in the Caprivi uh, once again by uh, Ben van der Waal. And they are endangered because their habitat is, appears to be very restricted and road building and other building alterations um, may threaten their future survival. Uh, the striped top minnow um, used to be called Aplocalichthys, now Micropancax myoposi. Uh, they um, live near the water surface uh, feeding on Newstone. We also, in addition to documenting the abundance, distribution, habitat preferences, and feeding preferences of Okavango fish, I uh, did try to gather as much data as we could on their uh, breeding methods. And top left is the sharp tooth catfish, uh, a large male chasing a smaller female during the courtship display. And they are examples of non guarders who produce eggs, which are fertilized um, outside the body in the water and then the eggs adhere to uh, vegetation and, and hatch. And then on the right is top is the foam nest uh, made by the African pike, quite remarkable innovation. And typically the foam um, extends over several um, upright stems of plants. And as the floodwaters rise and fall, the foam simply goes up and down, um, up and down the stems of the plants. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't um, get in, inundated uh, by the raised water. And then on the left is one of the uh, sand nests uh, dug um, by one of the cichlids. And on the right is a catfish on a spawning migration. Now, fortunately, uh, we haven't recorded any invasive alien fishes in the Okavango, but from our knowledge of um, invasive species elsewhere in Southern Africa, we sadly predict that these four species are likely to invade the Okavango and in fact may already be there but haven't been recorded. Um, the guppy, Priscilla reticulata, the mosquito fish uh, and the sword tail, all of those are, are live bearers. And then the, the Nile tilapia, uh, which is widely used in aquaculture um, in Africa and has penetrated into areas beyond its normal range, including uh, parts of South Africa. And there's a lot of pressure to introduce this fish uh, into the Okavango, or at least allow its, its culture in aquaculture projects uh, because it is very fast growing. But fortunately, the Botswana government has followed the advice of scientists and not allowed the species to be introduced into Botswana for any reason, even for aquaculture in, in ponds separate from natural wetlands. So it has not as yet invaded. But if it does invade, it's a very successful and aggressive invader and is likely to impact on the three spot tilapia and on other um, cichlid species. So we all hope that the Botswana authorities will maintain their strict policies not to allow these aliens um, fishes into Okavango, and uh, just as important, will have the manpower and the willpower to enforce their regulations uh, to prevent this from happening. Because at the moment, the Okavango is still a wilderness, 
apt without uh, invasive species, at least of fishes. Um, but uh, it will depend on how strictly the regulations are enforced, whether that situation continues. So here's a summary of uh, the main trends of what we found in the Okavango Delta and Chovy River. The number of fish species, 87, which is not very high, but I'll come back to that. What's perhaps more interesting is the number of fish genera, 39, which is a very high figure, and the number of families, 15, and the number of breeding gills, 18. Now, in all the marine and freshwater fishes of the world, there are only 29 different breeding gills that have been defined. So for the Okavango to have 18 of those 29 is quite remarkable. So the composition of the fish fauna, uh, the largest uh, proportion are, are uh, cyprinids, uh, which include the, the barbs and the labios, 24%. The catfishes, a wide variety of them, uh, 20 species, the cichlids, 19, and quite a high variety, um, diversity of uh, snout fishes in the Okavango and Chobe as well. And a very interesting aspect of Okavango fish distribution is that 60 species, 69%, reach their southern limit of distribution, either in the Okavango uh, Delta or in the southern reaches of the Kavango River. Uh, another 21 species extend southwards um, along the east coast of Africa, down into Maputaland, northern Zululand, and only six species of those that are found in the Okavango are widespread elsewhere in southern Africa, including South Africa. So this is what we call a, a subtraction zone or a transition zone geographically, uh, where these tropical uh, fishes, which are abundant further north, uh, in the uh, Kavango and Upper Zambezi and other rivers uh, extending into Central Africa reach their southern limit of distribution in the Okavango. Uh, just to, uh, I mentioned that 87 species is not a very high number. Um, and it's interesting to compare the Okavango with another system, part of the African Great Rift Valley, one of the African Great Lakes, Lake Malawi. In Lake Malawi, there are over a thousand different fish species. Admittedly, it's a much bigger water body, but what's remarkable is that 92% of those, about 920, are cichlid species. And in the whole of Lake Malawi, there are only about six fish families. And, and most of the, uh, of the fishes there are cichlids. And there are only four of the 29 uh, breeding gills um, represented in Lake Malawi, and 92% of those in the cichlids are in one guild. In contrast, in the Okavango, we have far fewer species, 87, uh, 19 cichlid species, but look at the number of families, 24 families of fishes in the Okavango Delta versus six in Lake Malawi, and 18 of the 29 breeding guilds known from of all fishes occur in the Okavango. So when we you know, consider animal diversity, we, ne we need to look beyond just species. We need to look at the higher categories such as genera and families, and also at some of the ecological guilds such as breeding guilds and also feeding guilds. And in a system like the Okavango with its diversity of habitats, it's constantly changing environment. It, it creates um, circumstances where a greater variety of fishes with many different breeding gills can survive and thrive. I should also mention that we, uh, we've complemented our uh, research on the Okavango wetland with research on other wetlands. And here, Glenn Merrin uh, also did work on the Pongola floodplain up in Maputaland. And these comparative studies help us to understand the characteristics of the different systems, why they support the fish that they do. And the Pongola floodplain is one of these systems that is at the southern end of those species uh, which extend down the east coast of Africa. And it is, for instance, is the southern limit of distribution of the tigerfish. And there um, on the right is a photograph of the catch uh, that Glenn has made and included in the catch is a little crocodile, uh, which he's holding in his hand. Now, in addition to our, our fish studies, we also assisted the Botswana government with a study 
on the impact of aerial spraying of insecticides on the tsetse fly. The tsetse fly was a problem in Botswana. It caused Nagana sleeping sickness in cattle and impacted on the cattle industry. So they wanted to get rid of the tsetse fly and the initial solution was to do aerial spraying from aeroplanes, fixed wing aeroplanes over the Okavango Delta. And the insecticide they initially used was endosulfan. And it was noticed that um, fish mortalities as shown on the right there were being caused uh, by endosulfan. So the Botswana government invited us to do a study on the impact of endosulfan spraying on fishes. And we worked very closely with the chief tsetse fly control officer, uh, um, Jeff Bowles, who you can see in the top right slide, um, walking along and talking to Glenn Merrin. And we did extensive work throughout the Delta, monitoring the uh, amount of endosulfan that reached the water and also the mortality rates, not only of fishes, but of some of the larger aquatic invertebrates. And this, this research was of great assistance to the Botswana government, and in fact, led to a policy change where they, uh, they decided to use a less harmful insecticide called Delta Methrin, uh, which doesn't dissolve in water and which is far less harmful uh, to aquatic life, fishes and uh, invertebrates. So that, that was a contribution that our research made to a major uh, policy change in the Okavango. And just for interest, I've illustrated top left, one of the hazards that we faced in the Okavango, and that is uh, fires, which can move at an alarming rate. And if you're not careful, can, can trap you um, with alarming consequences. Now, of course, one can't manage the Okavango without looking at the overall system, at, at the way in which resources are used, and, and um, all the other inhabitants of the Delta. And what we know from uh, research on cave paintings and so on, is that the Okavango has been fished uh, using a variety of methods, uh, spearing shown here uh, for thousands of years. In addition, of course, there are natural predators. There's a purple heron uh, feeding on a sharp toothed catfish and the black heron uh, with its uh, famous shadowing method uh, hunting uh, small fishes in shallow water. Uh, wooden makoros are the uh, main uh, means of um, moving around the delta, and these are both poled and paddled, but large trees have become extremely scarce in the Okavango, so a very positive development has been that fiberglass makoros are now being made, mainly for use in the tourist industry, but increasingly also uh, by the fishermen. And here's a very innovative fellow, a photograph taken by Paul Skelton in Northern Angola. And it's a canoe, a metal canoe made from the fuel tank of an F-84 Thunderjet, which belonged to the Portuguese Air Force and which was used in the Angolan War. And this plane crashed and uh, this canoe was made out of the fuel tank. Now, the resources of the Okavango are used in, in many different ways. Uh, some have involved simply foraging uh, for bulbs and corms. Others involve more destructive um, practices such as draining of swamps and then digging up uh, uh, bulbs and, and plants that are edible. Um, in addition, um, fish are poison, or poisons that, that kill fish uh, are extracted from um, local plants such as the milk bush, uh, the sap from this plant uh, interferes with the breathing of fishes and bark from various trees such as the tamboti and the leaves and beans of uh, the fish poison bean, Tephrosia vogeli, are some of the many examples of poisons that have been traditionally used uh, to harvest fishes. In addition, a variety of traps are used, and this is a photograph taken by Ben van der Waal in the Caprivi of uh, rock barriers and then valve traps set uh, in the openings of the rock barriers uh, to catch migratory fishes. Uh, by far the most common traps are the so-called omono valve traps, which have an entrance uh, the fish swim through and then and converging sticks which prevent the fish from swimming out again. And these are, are used extensively uh, in the Delta. 
Another kind of trap is called a constriction trap. It doesn't have a valve, but it, it has a shape which gets narrower and narrower, and the fish get caught uh, in the bottom end. And these are typically laid in, in fast flowing rapids. And there's a, another example of an elongate constriction trap. And there's a typical catch. Large numbers of snout fish have been caught in this constriction trap in the Kavango River uh, in Caprivi. And this is a very unusual constriction trap, a small one made specifically for one species of fish, and that is the snake catfish, Claris theodori, and uh, beautifully uh, crafted and uh, used in the upper Okavango. Another uh, interesting design is this fold up trap, which can be rolled up and then uh, it's simply deployed in that shape, which creates a little valve at the entrance and can catch the fishes. And then there are also uh, pool baskets and um, various other forms of, of pooled nets that are used. Then, of course, homemade fishing rods, um, often with the hooks made out of thorns um, or the horns of beetles or, or eagle claws, and more recently, boat hooks, uh, are used by boys for catching small fish. And there's a scene that, uh, in the Kavango River floodplain in Caprivi. Uh, where both rod and line and uh, traps are being used. Multi-barbed fishing spears have been recorded in Okavango for over a long period and are extensively used. And there's a young boy with his proud catch of a, a sharp-toothed catfish. And then the tigerfish, of course, is uh, a prime target for, for anglers, uh, but also uh, caught by traditional fishermen. And this is my daughter, Tracy, uh, holding a tiger fish that she caught. It's not as big as it looks. She's holding it right front uh, forward to the camera. Now, of course, what anglers catch is, was of great interest to our research project. So as part of his program, uh, Glenn Merrin um, set up uh, various uh, research units at fishing competitions to obtain data from fishes that the anglers caught and also advise them on, on conservation methods and how to use fishes sustainably. Um, as a parallel study in the Okavango and elsewhere in, in Africa, I, I've, I've also done research on traditional um, fishing methods and also cooking methods. And uh, just mentioned some of them that are used in the Okavango. Uh, small fishes tend to be sun dried and used in soups and stews. Uh, uh, currying fish with onion uh, is a very commonly practiced. These are, are labios, uh, which have been curried. And then uh, catfish, uh, the fishes with more oily flesh, uh, tend to be salted and, and sun-dried in this way. And I just should mention that uh, one of the, fish, uh, the cooking techniques that we learned on our expedition for the sharp tooth catfish involved gutting the fish and then uh, caking it in mud and then putting the, the, the fish caked in mud on coals and covering it over, and then a few hours recover, later recovering it, and you could peel off the caked uh, mud, uh, which kept, pulled the skin off as well, and underneath was a beautiful white fillet. And then smoking is also commonly practiced, uh, both to add taste to the fish, as well as to preserve them. And there you can see over a, a cold fire, um, they're being smoked in this basket. And there's a, um, an open smoking uh, fire, uh, very effective. And this is also typically used for the more oily flesh fish. Now, what about the threats to the Okavango fishes? Well, these are the typical threats that one considers when you're looking at biodiversity conservation, uh, handily summarized in this acronym HIPPO. Um, habitat destruction, this is not a particularly um, important one in the Okavango. There is some habitat destruction uh, while looking for barbs and in association with building and road building, but it's not a serious issue. As I said, uh, invasive species, none have so far been recorded, but it is a very distinct threat and needs to be carefully monitored. Uh, pollution, chemical pollution, was definitely caused by endosulfan spraying. 
Uh, fortunately, the Botswana government has now banned uh, the aerial spraying of ins uh, insecticides for tsetse flies. So this is under control. Uh, population explosion of humans and their domesticated animals is a threat to the Okavango. Uh, the increasing number of people encroaching on the wetlands, uh, tending to dry them out and interfere with water flow, as well as their cattle continues uh, to be a threat. And then over-exploitation, probably um, one of the bigger threats, and this is not necessarily by the local people, it's more often by immigrant um, um, fishermen who come from further north in Zambia, um, often with gill nets that have been provided to them and, and, and definitely can overexploit the fishes in the main delta and in Lake Ngami. And the Botswana government has recently banned uh, the export of dried fish uh, from Botswana. So this has um, reduced the impact um, of this, these exploitative practices. But there are nevertheless major threats uh, facing the Okavango. And of course, the most important thing about conserving that wetland is to maintain the natural pattern of floods. Because what we tend to do when wetlands uh, flood is we, we think that you know, what's good for the system is to stabilize it so that there's always water there and, and, and get rid of the flood. But that's the worst thing that one can do to a changeable habitat like this. So exploration by the Canadian company Recon Africa, uh, which started in April 2021, has revealed oil deposits in sedimentary rock. And if those deposits are exploited, that will potentially interfere with water flow. Furthermore, the Namibian government is considering placing a hydropower station uh, in the Kavango River in the Zambezi region. And although they claim this will not have an impact on the Okavango, uh, it will undoubtedly have an impact and potentially um, in interfere with the, the magnitude of the flood. Then human encroachment, especially on the west and from the south, is an increasing problem. Um, extraction of water in, in Angola and Namibia, and to a lesser extent uh, in Botswana, is an issue. Um, invasion by cattle has been an ongoing problem for decades. And then global warming, uh, which is likely to decrease annual rainfall uh, in both Angola and uh, Botswana, and increase temperatures, which will probably result in, in lower floods and a, a smaller surface area uh, being inundated. And the inundation of uh, the seasonal swamp is absolutely essential for the breeding of most Okavango fishes and also for the feeding of the younger fishes, which tend to inhabit shallow water where they are less vulnerable to uh, aquatic predators. And uh, of course, well vegetated zones, which decrease the risk of predation from birds. Another threat to the Okavango is the use of mosquito nets as seine nets. And this is a sort of double whammy, firstly, because they have such a fine mesh, they tend to catch everything down to the smallest little uh, fish larvae, uh, insect larvae, um, everything is caught and killed. And then secondly, uh, these nets are often impregnated with insecticides, uh, which get into the water. But I have learned that recently, um, mosquito nets deployed in Botswana, or if they have insecticide impregnated in them, it's delta methrin, uh, which is less harmful than other insecticides that have been used before. And there's a, a huge catch uh, made using mosquito nets and, and sadly, this is a problem throughout Africa now. And one can't blame traditional fishermen using the most efficient method available, but legislation needs to look at this and, and, and ban the use of mosquito nets for fishing. And mosquito netting is also now used uh, for traps, uh, which catch uh, everything down to the smallest fish and insect larvae. Poaching uh, continues to be a problem as I said, mainly from uh, immigrant uh, fishermen and using um, nylon gill nets uh, that have been supplied to them. And once again, gill nets, uh, especially those made out of nylon, are uh, a very big problem, not only in Botswana, but throughout Africa. 
and uh, there are active anti-poaching patrols and here's an example of poachers nets that have been collected and which were destroyed. Now what have we done about this? Well in addition to a large number of peer-reviewed scientific publications, we also produced many um, popular articles which were widely distributed in Botswana. We also went to the trouble of, of producing these beautiful posters which illustrate fish diversity and habitat preferences uh, in the Okavango and these were widely distributed free uh, to people throughout uh, the Delta. And there's a, another one, uh, Okavango, the interaction between humans and fishes uh, with some text associated with it. A few lessons from the Okavango, uh, and this is you know, from the broad research and conservation perspective. I think it's important to break new ground that where there's an ecosystem that has been understudied, even though there are massive logistical problems associated with researching it, it's important to do that work. And it is real world science. The kind of work we did there was of direct benefit to traditional fishermen and to policy makers. It also generated many insights of ecological relationships and fish distribution. And it helped our students to develop multidisciplinary skills and gain valuable field experience. We also created some wonderful partnerships with universities and, and, and government agencies in Botswana, and we were able to make positive impacts on their policies. Now, I'd like to say uh, end by mentioning some of the misadventures that we had, because working in a, a remote wild part of Africa does cause uh, all sorts of things to go wrong. And the first one I'll mention is the Great Kalahari Shipwreck, uh, where during one of our trips, uh, our aluminium uh, boat was being pulled behind a vehicle between Nata and Mount. And unfortunately, the trailer came loose from the, the Land Rover and went on and crashed into a tree, uh, which uh, became the Great Kalahari Shipwreck. And then on another occasion, uh, one of our scientists, I won't mention his name, but it's too embarrassing, uh, went off in uh, one of our Land Rovers uh, during the high flood. And because the water is so crystal clear there, he didn't realize that he was, had actually driven into the swamp until water started to come into his window and the engine cut off. And he rather shamefacedly went back to camp and we had to haul the Land Rover out of the, um, the swamp. On another occasion, we were in a fairly tense situation in a fast flowing part of the Delta. And uh, one of the uh, researchers was on to sign to throw out the anchor at a particular moment. And uh, when I shouted anchor overboard, he picked up the Nikon camera and threw it into the water. And we quickly dived in and retrieved the camera. And fortunately, we didn't lose the film. On another occasion, also a boat incident, we were driving this time from Mount towards Nata, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of the wheels on the, one, on the trailer came off, and we were driving along, we felt this resistance of the trailer, and the trailer wheel went bounding down the road past us and created a massive problem for us to uh, get mobile again. And then on a more traumatic note, um, one of the most interesting habitats in the Okavango is under the floating papyrus mats. And these cover, cover tens of uh, kilometers in the Delta and are very, very important habitat, but extremely difficult to get to. So I decided on one of our trips that I would take my goggle and snorkel and dive under the papyrus mats uh, to have a look around. Now, um, we didn't have scuba available, so I just had to do breath hold diving. And there, there's sort of gaps in the papyrus where you can pop up and take a breath. Anyway, on this occasion, I popped up, took a breath, and then went along and swam. And a minute or so later, I went back to the place where there, there'd been a hole in the papyrus. And unfortunately, the papyrus had closed up and I was trapped underwater. And I very, very nearly drowned, but I managed to fight my way through the papyrus and, and gasp for air. And then I had become so disorientated, I'd forgotten where the main channel was. So I had a real job uh, swimming back to the channel in the boat. And then uh, the hyena boot chomp. Um, this was uh, during a camp 
uh, with the uh, geography department at, at Rhodes. Uh, we were sleeping just in the open on our, our ground sheets at, at Third Bridge. And I was woken in the night by the sensation of moving. And I looked down uh, towards my boots, because you always sleep with your boots on there. And a hyena had grabbed my boot and was busy trying to pull it off my foot. And unfortunately, I got rid of him. And then Humphrey for dinner. Well, Humphrey Greenwood, the prominent British fish, uh, fish scientist uh, who worked with us, one evening after a hard day's work, we decided to go for a walk. This was um, in the Moraimi Game Reserve. And our camp at that stage was on a peninsula um, uh, around, surrounded by a swamp. Anyway, after about an hour, we walked back towards the camp and then to our horror found that a pride of lions had taken up um, a position at the entrance uh, of this uh, isthmus to, uh, towards our camp. And we had a real dilemma because we couldn't walk through the water, which was full of crocodiles and hippos. Um, so we decided to just chance our luck and walk straight past the lines. And true to the normal behavior, the lines took absolutely no notice of us, although we were sort of creeping along within about 20 meters of them and got safely back to camp. And at that same camp, um, we then decided to, in fact, sleep on the carrier, roof carriers of our Land Rovers because of the presence of lions. And I was woken up in the middle of the night by something bumping my shoulder and I feared the worst. And when I opened my eyes, it was in fact a giraffe, an inquisitive giraffe, finding out what's going on. And then meerkats galore. Well, meerkats are very uh, common animals in, up in Moraimi and, and uh, everything that we saw uh, became uh, meerkat. Um, and then I'd like to mention one other thing that happened at Karakwe. Uh, we established a temporary camp during the Tsetse flyer research. And Jeff Bowles had provided wonderful tents and camping facilities and so on. And I flew up from Grahamstown and, and then we, Jeff and I got into a, a helicopter to fly over to the Karakwe camp that Glenn had set up for us. And as we hovered over the, the site of the camp, to our horror, the whole landscape was black. And there was poor Glenn, black with suit and smoke, sitting on the remains of his camp. And a fire had swept through uh, Karakwe, burnt all his tents, the nylon tents, and all the plastic furniture, etc. And he had had to run into the swamp uh, to escape the fire. And then top left is another problem that we encountered, the Narakwa blockage, uh, can, channels that were previously open that, uh, in a few months earlier had suddenly become blocked and passage was extremely difficult. And then top right, you can see the Unimog that we bought for the Okavango work, uh, which turned out to be a really problem problematic and unstable vehicle. Anyway, these are the sort of challenges that one needs to overcome in the Okavango. So to finish off, just to say that this book packs a, a, a really hefty package. These are the chapters you'll find in it. Okavango Delta and Chobe River, physical description, then the description of the habitats and habitat preferences, feeding and breeding, survival tactics of the fishes, discussion of rare and endangered species, hints for um, sustainable angling, how to identify a fish, and then the most of the book are the species accounts uh, using and conserving Okavango fishes, factors threatening them, and checklists. And even if you don't visit the Okavango Delta, I think you'd find this book very useful because a lot of the fishes mentioned uh, are ones you'll come across elsewhere. And so the topics that we discuss in the 87 species accounts are the names, including the local uh, Setswana names, the classification, the size, how to identify and diagnose it, and all sorts of aspects of their biology, habitat preferences, angling potential, conservation status. So the book is packed full of uh, valuable information, and I certainly hope that you get a copy. Thank you very much. Prof, what an amazing, what an amazing presentation. Oh, um, I think um, 
the one question that comes to mind immediately is um, do you eat fish <laughs> Having done such extensive um, um, research on fish specifically, Sorry, what is your question? Uh, do you do you eat fish? <laughs> oh yes, no, for sure. I mean, conservation is also about sustainable use. It's not about you know not touching things in 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 the in the sea and in the wetlands and so on. I love eating fish, uh, but I'm very. Um, aware of which fish species are threatened and endangered and which should not be harvested and, and, and eaten. And there are other fishes which you know, can um, survive sustained um, harvesting at a certain level and which you know, should, uh, we should eat them. And my, my favorite fishes from the Okavango are the butter catfish, uh, delicious fitrits, uh, the sharp tooth catfish, and then some of the larger tilapias. Oh, lovely! I, I mean, looking at the at the presentation and some of the the fish that you were you were uh, it was being prepared there, I was thinking, oh, that looks way too delicious, you know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so so I absolutely liked it, and um, everybody on the chat also, you know, um, sharing the same sentiment. Um, how wonderful this presentation has been. And um, we've got a, a few questions, uh, Prof, and I just want to jump straight into it, um, just to, you know, as we also trying to manage um, uh, load shedding as we moving along. Let me just take these two quick questions quickly that are coming on some of our social media platforms. Um, and one um, uh, coming from and asking specifically, say, uh, Prof, do modern young scientists um, with, uh, with all of their laboratory equipment, still do field research, uh, like you did in Okavanga, for instance? Well, yeah, I feel so lucky that during my career, uh, Rhodes University had a field research station up in at Lake Sabaya, where I, I spent uh, about six years, um, that we were able to um, mount expeditions to the Okavango from the... Uh, so the Institute for Aquatic Biology, as it's called now, uh, Aquatic Biodiversity. And um, yeah, I don't think that modern students have as many opportunities for field research. And, um, you know, there's a, this obsession now with uh, laboratory equipment and, and, and molecular work and so on, which is very important. But there's still so many of our fish species, as well as our other animal species, that we don't fully understand their biology in the field. And that's something that can only be uh, studied in the field. So, um, you know, I, I really think that our young biologists should be given more opportunities to work in the field and in deep remote areas, which are, are difficult to access, uh, but which are understudied. And uh, you know, even in Southern Africa, not only the Okavango, but one thinks of Northern Mozambique, I know it's a problematic area from the ISIS perspective, but there are parts of northern Mozambique that haven't been explored for over 70 years. And um, yeah, so I, I, I would hope that our young scientists have more opportunities in the future to work in the field. It's so important for their development and for their understanding of plants and animals. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, and, and, and and with, you know, with the answer as you are giving, you know, one thinks of, you know, sometimes often constrained resources and um, opportunities to be able to tap into those resources to be able to do this type of field work. And, um, and one critical thing, uh, you know, as you are wrapping up the, the presentation that I thought to myself, oh, I think we're seeing another book coming from you. And this one would probably be Adventures of the Scientist. <laughs> you know, all the things that, you know, one in your profession needs to do, you know, you need to be able to learn how to swim and, and most importantly have uh, uh, awesome survival skills uh, to survive out in the open. Um, uh, but John, Prof, yeah. let me just take two questions. Sorry, could yeah. I just, uh, you know, Glenn Merrin and I, in fact, have discussed that, uh, uh, producing a book on our misadventures in the Okavango. And one that I didn't mention, we flew up to Shikawi in, in Ted Baines' uh, Cessna four-seater. And we landed on a some makeshift airstrip and we tied the airplane down, covered it with uh, canvas, et cetera, 
and then about two weeks later went back to the airplane to find that hyenas had eaten away half of one of the solid rubber tires. Now, you can't buy airplane wheels in, in Chikawi, so we had a real dilemma. And, and Ted Baines, the pilot, said, I can still take off with half a wheel. And in fact, he achieved that. But the, the bigger challenge was landing in Maun. And we, at, when we got to Maun, he actually had to land on the, on the grass verge of the cement airstrip because uh, it wouldn't have worked to land it on the cement. Sure, I, I mean, I mean, this is this is this is real research right there. <laughs> what an amazing documentary that I would love to see. And and Prof, we're gonna hold you to it. We really want to see. We want to see that uh, that book coming out. But let me just take a quick uh, couple of questions quickly. Um, let me take um, perhaps maybe two or three at a time, uh, just to manage um, some of the uh, the challenges that we have with with connection. Um, Judy asking. Uh, what is a breeding guild? And I think you, you touched a little bit on it uh, in the presentation. Sandy, uh, Sandy asking us, um, say, hey, Prof, uh, perhaps maybe you may still cover this. This was during the presentation. But what is the, um, the incidence, if any, uh, of uh, Bil uh, Bilhazia uh, in the Okavanga Delta, uh, given the presence of water lilies and the shallow uh, stagnant ponds, uh, for instance. Alex also asking, um, uh, okay, we've lost you, John. I'm not sure if the guests can hear me, but let um, me talk. We, we can hear you, uh, Mike, and I think maybe you can- okay, I'll carry on with the breeding. The breeding guild is a group of fishes that breed in the same way. Uh, for instance, they, they may be mouth brooders, um, like the three spot um, tilapia, where the fertilized eggs are taken into the mouth of the female, and that's where they live for the first few weeks and hatch into fry, and then eventually uh, uh, leave. Um, the foam nesting behavior of the African pike is a, another example of a breeding guild. So, and, and there are others, you know, where most fishes, in fact, about 85% um, of fishes, the eggs are released by the female and then fertilized in the open water and they're not um, guarded. And they're different kinds of non-guarders. So, you know, research of all the 30,000 species of fishes worldwide, marine and freshwater, has revealed that there are 29 different breeding guilds different ways of breeding and remarkably 18 of those occur in the Okavango. And then as far as Bilhazia is concerned, yes, it does occur in the Okavango. It's a constant threat to freshwater biologists, um, but, you know, we do take measures to avoid infection. Mike, can I read you the next question? Um, it's from Alex Watkins and says, are Carpenta considered an invasive species yet? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the Carpenta were introduced uh, into uh, Lake Kariba uh, from African Great Lakes further north. And it's interesting that the one that, that thrived was not the one that they originally intended to create a fishery around. But certainly, uh, if Capenta were introduced into the Okavango, that would definitely be regarded as an invasive species. But they are fishes that you know need lots of open water, um, big midwater habitat. So there are limited opportunities for them. But there are some permanent lagoons in in the Okavango, such as Guma and so on, where you know they could survive. So I would definitely. Um, not be in favor of introducing them. Okay. okay. And then we've got two questions from Casey Boone saying, hi, Mike, thanks for the excellent talk. Two questions come to mind. One, are there any planned or upcoming large scale surveys of the Okavango to investigate the presence distribution of the potentially invasive species that you highlighted? Well, the National Geographic program that Paul Skelton is still involved in is, is ongoing, um, but I'm not sure that they are focusing on that particular issue. 
you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the, with the publication of our book and all our scientific work, the onus really now rests on uh, the University of Botswana, its researchers and uh, government funded researchers in Botswana to continue this important work. Um, you know, Paul and I are now both retired, um, um, uh, you know, and I, I'm sure both of us would be happy to give advice, but the baton has really been handed on to young Botswana based researchers now. Thank you. And then the second question is, would underwater cameras be suitable rapid sampling gear for the system, i.e. is the turbidity low enough for at least part of the year to make underwater cameras visible, viable, sorry. Um, yes, that's a, an exciting idea. Um, I, I think underwater cameras could be used in some of the clear water lagoons and um, you know, some exciting information could come out of that. Obviously, one would only deploy them where there's permanent water. We wouldn't want to do it where the water dries up because some mahina or other will come along and chomp it. But um, yeah, it's, it's a great idea. And, and there are certainly some of the deeper clear water lagoons where it, it might work very well. And then we had another question about um, the posters that you showed. Where would we, um, they be able to find the beautiful posters that you showed? Right. I'm not sure if they're still in press, but you can uh, contact the uh, SA, uh, SAIB, S A I A B, South African uh, Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity in Makanda Grahamstown. Um, and if they have uh, copies of the poster, I'm sure they'll make them available to you. Thanks, Mike. Um, and then we've got another question. Which is the most interesting fish in the Okavango, in your opinion? Well, that, that you know, the, the snout fishes, which we haven't really taken much notice of until recently, have proved to be fascinating. And we now know that they communicate with one another using electrical discharges. Uh, they detect their prey's electrical field they can detect the electrical field of their predators, but they also make sounds. So they communicate using clicks and other sounds underwater. And some of them have been found to have complex um, courtship behavior um, and, and to be um, guarders, uh, nest guarders. Uh, so they, they look after the fertilized eggs after they've uh, been fertilized and, and until they grow into young independent fishes. So, yeah, a fish that we didn't really think was very interesting has turned out to be fascinating. And then, of course, our discovery of the foam nests of the African pike uh, was great fun and um, has attracted a lot of international attention. Yeah, and I think we're going to have um, John coming back on again. To... We have you, John? Yes, Prof. Um, sure. I think um, I think uh, by the end of of all this load shedding and all this <laughs> intermittent connections, we're gonna uh, have to write the book of our own, just like your adventures of of research when you're out there in the field, Prof. <laughs> prof urban, um, urban misadventures. Uh, oh. Yes. <laughs> Most certainly, most certainly. Um, Prof, I don't think we've got um, any more questions that I can see from my side. Um, Belinda, I don't know if uh, there's anything that you can pick up from your side there. No, I think that's a, that's a wrap. If oh, I may make awesome. A, if, may I make a concluding comment? Uh, yes, yeah, please, one, Prof. If, go you go to, if you go to websites on the Okavango, to my amazement, you'll see pictures of elephants and sitatunga and various birds and so on. And they seem to completely ignore the fact that the Okavango is an aquatic ecosystem and among the most important inhabitants of it are the fishes. So, you know, there are entire books written about the Okavango and, 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 and websites and, and so on, which completely ignore the fishes. So I, I sincerely hope if some of our visitors do have the opportunity to go there and uh, there, for instance, now have direct flights from Cape Town to Maun and Goberg to Maun, um, take notice of the fishes in addition to all the, the fabulous fur balls and the 
you know, the extrovert birds. Oh, Prof, um, no, thank you so much for that. I think um, you've just literally motivated us to, you know, just to take that shot left once more and, um, yeah. and explore. Uh, most importantly, but um, I want to put you on the spot now. I want you to give us some sort of deadline. So what's going to happen now? Tell us, um, when can we expect this amazing adventure book of yours? <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, John, you've, you've laid down the gauntlet. I will zap off an email to Glenn Mirren and tell, you know, of the interest in this book. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll put something together. Ah, Prof, um, no, most certainly we will hold you to it. And um, the, ladies and the gentlemen, most important, um, the most difficult thing is to find a publisher. So if I can find a publisher, I think we would undertake to have this book um, go to press by the end of next year. Oh, um, I, I don't want to say too much, uh, Prof, but um, I have friends. Um, uh, and, and, and they are called straight nature, just in case you are wondering who my friends are. <laughs> <laughs> but topic for another day. Um, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard it, um, Prof uh, Bruton um, uh, was the past director of JLB Smith Institute, and uh, now the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity in Makanda, uh, the Education Trust of the Two Oceans Aquarium in Cape Town. Um, I have to mention this, Prof, uh, just before we let you go. In 2001, he was awarded the National Science Technology Forum Awards uh, for the contributions to science by an individual. And in 2021, he received the, the prestigious uh, Maloth Medal from the Royal Society of South Africa for his contribution to science and science communication. Um, Prof, I have to absolutely mention this because of the work that you do is absolutely amazing. We are so blessed to have the kind of wealth uh, that you bring to this platform. Um, you know, having you here, it's, it's an absolute honor. Um, we continue to, you know, to love the work that you do. Uh, we extremely support the work that you do, all the books that you've laid out here that you've contributed towards. And uh, we will be going out in numbers and getting this, uh, these books, making sure that we've got them on our shelves. Uh, this is important for the preservation of biodiversity. So from myself and to everybody that's still on the call now, we just want to, you know, send out our heartfelt thank you so much for the work that you do. And um, uh, we pray that you continue to be blessed to give us more good work like this, like you've promised uh, that you've got a book coming up soon. So uh, we'll definitely John, John, look out for that. Yes, may I, may, I, may I end this uh, session by dedicating this talk uh, to Professor Brian Allenson. I first met Professor Allenson in my first year at Rhodes University in 1966. 57 years ago, and he and I have remained firm friends and colleagues ever since then. Uh, sadly, mm -hmm. he died two years ago, uh, two days ago, uh, earlier this week. Ah, Prof, um, definitely not um, not the, the news we, we, we wanna, um, you know, sign off with, uh, but, um, but I think uh, the gift of life and the contributions that you've made, those are the memories that will stay with all of us. And um, what we learned from the Okavanga, um, you know, exhibitions, expeditions that you've taken uh, will definitely carry us into, into a lifetime and generations to come. So thank you to you, Prof. Um, to everybody else on the call, thank you so much for joining us on this amazing uh, presentation uh, by Professor Mike uh, Bruton. Um, he is an aquatic scientist and, um, and someone who, uh, whom you definitely want to interact with. Um, he's now consulting, and I have to mention this as we close, um, he's uh, consulting um, here in Cape Town through the Mike Bruton uh, Imagineering, um, and he's mainly uh, focused currently now in designing science centers and museums. So um, he's continuing to contribute to science, and we will continue to give, me, to give you more and more awards for the work that you do, Prof. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, from my side, uh, from our friends from Room to Grow and our friends from Straight Nature. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure having you guys on the call. Um, let's stay strong and let's stay focused as we um, work towards our next Wednesday talk happening in the next two weeks. So from my side, John and Sandy, thank you very much, everybody. We will see you guys next time. And um, thanks to Katie and all the team. Prof, thank you very much and all the best. <laughs>